one. And to explain, it's very difficult. And we have Ganesh, we have Shiv, we have Krishna, we all Brahma. For all we know that we tend to be a God because we're all gods. But when you go to middle school and high school, when the kids face this question that you have many gods, you know, uh, how would you explain See, this? See, in chapter 5 of this book, I have a, the whole chapter is called Non-Translatable Words of Sanskrit. Non-translatable words. So, Devata is not to be translated as gods. You have to, Shakti should not be translated as energy because then there's no, no divinity left, you see. So, I, I, I claim that certain words, like thankfully we did not translate yoga as exercise or gymnastics or <laughs> So, you see, when you preserve a word, then you have control over defining what it means. So if you say, I, we do yoga, then they'll ask you, what does it mean? Like Gandhi never translated Satyagraha. So the British judge keeps asking, what are you doing? He says, I'm doing Satyagraha. So he says, what does it mean? So he keeps describing the process, how it means, but does not replace it with an English word. And then the, uh, the judge says, what's the purpose? What will it lead to? He says, it will lead to Swaraj. He has another word. So you have control. You get power, empowerment. So what we have to teach our kids is devatas. What is a devata? How do these, how do these devas and devis, how do they relate to Brahman? And how these different devatas are our access points, our ways, our different portals to access the one. And these are different portals, like you have different access points on the internet to reach the same. So we have different portals, different intelligences, different aspects of the one that we have access to. And it's a very user-friendly God. It's a very user-friendly God that says, I'm not a roof sitting somewhere, you, you, you create a form of me, I'll come and do or something. Uh, it's a very playful God. Look at Krishna, he's a child, he's a playful child also. He's a, he's a lover, he's a friend, he's in all these different, uh, he's manifested in all the relationships people are going to come across. So God is present in all kinds of forms and all kinds of relationships for different temperaments and different people to relate to. So we have to, if we hang on to the word Devata and said we worship deities that we call Devatas and if you call it gods then they have a certain concept of Greek gods and pagan gods then it comes into polytheism then our choice in monotheism or polytheism is already fallen on the trap of their language so that neither choice is acceptable to me. Because if you say monotheism, then why do you have so many deities? If you say polytheism, then you are into another kind of a dimension that you have many truths. You are modern relativism. You don't have one truth because you don't have one ultimate reality, which is not true. So it is neither monotheism nor polytheism. And losing our categories and mapping ourselves onto somebody else's categories is what I call Western universalism. Those categories are Western universalism. And mapping us onto those categories is what I call digestion. We're getting digested into their into Western universalism. So that's what this book is trying to point out. And chapter five gives you 20 examples, including uh, devatas as an example, uh, to say that these words are non-translatable. So you can speak English, teach your kids to be <coughs> speaking fluent in English, but there should be somewhere around 25, 50, some words like that, which they should be taught non-translatable and tell him that use the original word, Sanskrit word when you're talking and explain it in great detail. Be, be, be prepared to explain it in great detail. Americans respect uh, difference if you're able to explain. So once you have gotten into the monotheism versus polytheism language, then you are into their trap, into the jar. You've gotten stuck into a net and now you have those two binary choices, they're mutually exclusive. You, you're contradictory if you say both, you know. Then they'll say, you know, you're not clear, you're, not, you're confused. So you don't want to map your category and your terminology in, for certain words. That's my approach. Thank you. There's always a common question asked um, to many of us that, oh, you Hindus believe in lots of gods. So sometimes we Indians, um, I have seen many of my friends doing that, that, oh yeah, they just laugh at it because it's hard to explain them why we have it and sometimes kids may not have a clear understanding of why. Okay, so the question is, uh, 
people say, well, you, you have many gods. And, and that's yeah, they look different. They are like kind of, you know, uh, elephant's head on right, fat right. body and right. that kind of thing. Right, right. So they're all these gods and they're weird and they're strange mm -hmm. and, and so uh, it embarrasses people. Are they aliens? People. Even in, on the lower level, there are talks like, oh, you worship aliens or yeah. something like that. Yeah. No, I understand the question. I understand the question. I'm just repeating the question then, uh, yeah. you know. So the question is, you know, that you have so many gods and there's some of them are very strange and uh, it just makes the Indian kid feel very embarrassed and humiliated and he doesn't know what how to answer it. And if he answers it, then if, if there's another follow-up question and he ultimately gives up and then he never wants to acknowledge his identity mm -hmm. because it raises embarrassment, you know. So one of the things that I've suggested to the person in the previous session who asked the same question is that uh, the moment you've translated devatas as gods, you've gotten into that trap. Because the gods, the idea of gods uh, is a kind of a pagan idea from Greece and Rome, the pre-Christian people of Europe. Uh, and their idea of gods is very different than our devatas. I mean, they really did believe that you are worshipping a rock or that Free. Uh, and, and, and it was not like there is one and there's many forms and many intelligences uh, that you have access to these, to that one. So when you trust, part of the problem is that we've, we've allowed the translations and we've not resisted the translations. So just like yoga cannot be, yoga cannot be translated as exercise or gymnastics or prayer. Yoga is yoga. And you want to explain a, uh, the concept by using that term and explaining what it means in its own way without reducing it to some other term that they are more familiar with. Because once you, had, once you translate yoga as a, you know, exercise, then, then you are not able to define what it means, what it really is. So my strategy has been that I say we, we worship devatas. We have deities, devas and devis, and I will explain to you what they are without saying that they are gods because then you have a certain idea of what gods mean. So this way I have a little more control over the discussion because I have brought it into my own terms which I know better than them and rather than be, uh, allowing them to bring their preconceived ideas about gods, they have to clear the slate and understand what a devata is. So at least I have done the first thing which is clear the slate of prior ideas by saying I don't have gods, I have a devatas. So now I explain to you what devatas are, so now the guy has to listen to me. Because whatever ideas he has of gods are no, not valid because these are not gods, they are devatas. So I'll explain to you what that is. So that way, that's the first step. You take control of the vocabulary. You see, if you take control of the vocabulary, then it will help you. Now, the second thing you can, you can say is that the idea of devata, the way the devata relates to the one, must be understood. And these devatas are not sort of independently existing entities that are separate from one another and separate from the one and that may be part of the confusion that you are having. And these devatas are different aspects, different intelligences, but they are ultimately accesses to the same one. And you can have access through various means depending on your predisposition, depending on your emotional state, depending on your preferences. So this is not alien to uh, the American that, you know, there is one United States of America but there is Department of X and there is Department of Y, there is various departments and there is various agencies, you can access them by phone, you can visit them, you can go on the internet, you can access them through your congressman. So the idea that there is a, there's a multiplicity of expressions and presences, points of presence of the same one, should be not very alien to them if you explain it. So the difference, the problem is that we are neither monotheistic nor polytheistic. We should have our own, we should control our diversity, our, our terminology. The monotheism will, if you say it's monotheistic, then all these other deities are sort of weird and something strange and they're anomalies and you have a problem. And if you say polytheistic, then these different deities are actually totally independent entities. There's a multiplicity of totally independent gods. And then you are in the problem of, well, you don't know what the truth is because depending on which god you're listening to as if they are really conflicting in separate entities. So I, I feel that one of the major uh, lessons that I am trying to explain in this book, in chapter 5, uh, chapter 5 is called Sanskrit Non-Translatables, which means what cannot be translated. So yoga is there, and 
Devatas is there. Shakti should not be translated as energy because when you say energy, it means just some electricity, something physical. It's not divine. It's lost its divinity when you just say energy. So uh, there is no equivalent for Shakti. Sometimes a uh, certain civilization has an experience which is so special and so unique to itself that they have a word for it. And another civilization did not have that experience. So they don't have a word for it. Like Eskimos have certain words in the language that we wouldn't uh, be able to find an equivalent in our language. So we should learn their word. So what you can do as ambassadors of uh, our civilization is you should take, in this book I introduce about 25 words in chapter 5, which are not translatable and should not be translated. And I explain why the common translations are actually a problem. So I go further, like for instance, Atman I don't like being translated as soul. Because soul doesn't reincarnate. Soul doesn't reincarnate. It lives only once. Soul is always separate from God. Even in heaven, the separate soul lives separate from God. And animals don't have soul, they have Atman. Even plants are Atman. But animals and plants don't have souls. So when you translate something, then you're on the defensive. Because the word has a certain meaning and a long history controlled by another group of people. They have some ideas about it, they have some value judgments about it. And you are now trying to redefine and take control of what that word really means. Whereas if you, if you say, well, the nature of the self is up, and I will explain to you what that is, at least you've got their attention because now, you know, there's something they have to learn. They can't just, if you say soul, then they think they already know. And they have an argument on what is soul. So I would say some of the problems we face is uh, because the English language has dominated so much. We've had to translate to be understood by others. But now we're becoming more powerful and strong and we don't have that same complex that others should understand on their own terms. So rather than mapping ourselves into their framework, we can control our framework. We can and I'm not saying don't speak English, you must speak English is a wonderful language, it's very important. And I'm not saying that you have to learn only Sanskrit all the time, uh, speak only Sanskrit. But 50 words, it's not a big deal. You can teach 50 words to a child and say these words have no equivalent. And just use these words. So that's how I would suggest a large part of the prejudice and a large part of the misinformation can be correct. In the midst of Diverse states. How do they figure out the right from the wrong? Which ah. can be relative between the different states. Absolutely. This is a, a very important question because even in Mahabharata, they are debating who's uh, what is right. Mm -hmm. the debate on what is right is is more complex and more profound when you don't have a canonized, you know, Ten Commandment type rules, that kind of a thing, and you don't have a central Vatican-like adjudication authority. Which is like, which has got the authority of, uh, you know, uh, fatwas. The, the the Vatican, in, uh, the bishops, uh, until recent centuries, they had these fatwa type properties, uh, uh, rights. They could have their police authority. They could enforce this on. So since we don't have that, uh, there is a huge reliance on self actualization to be in a state of sattvic living and be in a state of consciousness where you are guided. So ultimate Swadharma comes from an inner guide, ultimate. But since we are not there yet, and we are certainly not anchored there on a permanent basis, provisionally you have guides who are gurus, who are uh, you know acharyas, who you can go to from their point of view to get advice. Yeah? As to right and wrong, because somebody else can better tell you that look, this is part of your ego desire. And if you do it, you are enhancing your ego and you're fixed in a karma. And maybe it's a good idea to just wait and see what happens and don't just jump into this. If somebody else is sometimes better at telling you that, then you can figure it out yourself. And so I would say that the right uh, approach to being able to choose right from wrong is twofold. Long term, you create a sadhana, you develop a sadhana, a certain lifestyle which gives you a cleansing, a purity, and an inner awakening that guides you. Short term, because this will take, the long term will take a while, depending on how much baggage we are bringing that we have to get into. Uh, short term, you need guidance. You need competent guidance from people who are 
uh, well informed and who can give you some advice on right and wrong, do's and don'ts, and you follow them. So that that and that is that is uh, prescribed. That if you are if you are not at the stage where you get this flowering of spontaneous action from within, uh, you basically follow the examples of those who've been there before you that you respect. So it's a you know our uh, one of the talks I gave is uh, dead historical saints versus living spiritual masters. It's a very uh, profound difference. We are dependent on the, the living, uh, you know, guru, acharya, the person who is the sannyasi. We, are, we, we, are, we really need that. Our tradition valorizes that and respects that because uh, our tradition says that this is a living uh, thing that we manifest and we need this, these people and therefore we, we worship them, we support them, we, we really honor them uh, and, and they have sacrificed their whole life to do this for us. And we respect them for that. Uh, whereas in the Vatican, the priest and the pope and the bishop are not enlightened beings. They're not supposed to be enlightened beings. They're not. It is not required that they're enlightened beings. They're more like a, 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 a kshatriya or a CEO who's running an enterprise, and they have to be an administrator, you know, follow the rules. But the Articles of Incorporation of the company and its bylaws and its HR department manual are set, and their job is to follow them. See, so the dependence on the quality of the human being is not there so much. So what has happened is we have two different kinds of continuity. In the Western system, the continuity is through institutional mechanisms and enforcement and policing. And the continuity in the dharmic systems is a, a lineage of, of living masters. Living, living, the living guru is far more important in our tradition than in the Western tradition where the priest is, is sort of just carrying out the uh, thing. You know, just carrying out. So that's, that's the difference there. But nice question. Great. Thank you very much uh, for your enlightening discussion and your service to the community. Well, thank you for listening. And I'm honored and delighted that Swamiji, I am so honored that you invited me here. And thank you very much for doing this. So we'll be close now. We enjoy your talking. Thank you so much.
who said, I think I am, therefore I am, and we know, our, we know that we can be, that there is a level of consciousness much higher than that. Mm -hmm. So I think your point is that while we have, we are, uh, you know, we are the heirs to a very high thinking, uh, at the same time, a very humble practitioner, we're not able to give them a straight answer, if, if, that's, the, if that's the question. Mm -hmm. And I think you're absolutely right, and, but I think that what this shows is something different to me, not a contradiction. It shows that there are many access points at different levels of consciousness from the humble practitioner who says, I don't have a need, I'm not a professor, I'm not a teacher, I don't have a need to be able to explain it. I'll, as long as I can utilize time, as long as I can utilize my bhakti for Ram, I am not a theoretician who is going to go and give a lecture, I don't need to do it. And so we have that available to us. Yesterday, uh, there were some students who were uh, wanted a, a workshop from me, uh, you know, on Hinduism, and they were all saying one of the problems, one of the barriers is it's so complex. We have so much work to do, so much thinking of Hinduism before we can be Hindu. And I said that's not true. You, you know, that's only true if you want to be a scholar. But if you want to be a practitioner, you just pick one little aspect and just go for it. So we were discussing, and this young kid he said that. Uh, uh, he, that what I described as a states of consciousness, he says, you know, I have that uh, playing sita. He said that. So I said, that is wonderful because that is part of our tradition. You don't need to know all about all the deities. You don't need to know all of the metaphysics. If your practice of music, your practice of music is a kind of yoga, nāda brahman. You know, I said, you go, go into that. The idea of vibration and the idea of sound as something uplifting. And he felt very happy about it. He said, oh, it doesn't mean I, I, I'm, I'm a Hindu because I do get that feeling. I said, yes, you are. Because that is one way of being one. And if, you, if you're a dancer and you are really into that dance bhakti and that, that feeling that you get when you're dancing, uh, that is fine for you. You do not have to. Our tradition has so many access points, so many, it's like a house with so many ways of getting in, that you are not an architect who wants to get a map of everything. You don't need to be an architect. To drive a car, you don't have to be an automobile engineer. You just need to know enough to drive the car. So, for a person at a very basic level, they just need to have clicked with one of the methods and then they should just follow that method and not worry about having the overall knowledge of the whole map. That's what the, my answer would be for somebody like your grandmother. And then somebody else who is more philosophically oriented, who wants to go into Gyanyo, who wants to understand the higher states and, and really get, uh, we, have, we have unparalleled resources and teachers like Swamiji, we have Jhochen Ma Mission, or people want to go for that. But nowhere is it required that everybody is to be at that level. There are people who will do, who will do some very basic bhakti, they have a favorite Ishta Devta, they will do their bhakti, and I would say to you, they are just fine. Don't try to tell them there is something wrong with you because you have not understood the whole thing. You don't need to understand the whole thing. We have people like Mira, we have so many great exemplars who are not philosophers, but they, they had the right view, the right attitude, and they were fine. So I don't think that uh, a practitioner like your grandmother who cannot theorize and a, a, a teacher or teaching at the level which is very high, I don't see that as a contradiction. I see that as something very beautiful. Because it says that there's many people with many many kinds of predispositions, many swabhas, many kinds of tendencies, and there's something for everyone. So I see it more like that. So if we look at 200 years, uh, Indians haven't done it. Uh, so what is going on in India, whether you look at uh, religion, whether you look at uh, medicine, whether you look at physics, funny, all those things are okay. But how come? We have, we meaning we Indians in India, have decayed to a point where we cannot really claim, uh, uh, take pride in anything that we have done in the last 200 years. Well, there is a whole dismantling of the traditional Indian system uh, and replacing it with a different kind of colonial system started in the early 1800s, which is quite well documented. And if you want to read more about it, there's a Gandhian who died a few years ago called Dharambal. And he actually documents how the British had a plan, dismantled it, discussed the, 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 uh, the dismantling of the Indian traditional knowledge system and replacing it with something else which would serve the colonial purpose 
to raise people to work for them and to think of British as the authorities and disown their own culture. So there's a whole history of how the colonial system works. But I, and this is not something original I'm saying. There's a whole body of knowledge called post-colonial studies. There's thousands of people who work in post-colonial studies and they write books and books and books and you can read a lot of books. So there's no, I, I have no original contribution to make on the history of, of the colonializing, colonizing the Indian mind. I would say that actually the problem goes back a thousand years earlier because the destruction of Nalanda, the destruction of Takshashila, uh, actually Bihar and about 20 of these universities. The word Bihar comes from the word Bihar. Bihar is institution. They were, it was the place of institutions, world famous institutions. And when these were destroyed, the centers of R&D and thinking and exemplars and all these great uh, thinkers we know of, they weren't, they weren't there anymore, it was not continued anymore. It's like if somebody were to come and shut down all the Ivy Leagues and all the research centers and Bell Labs and you know, Lucent and all these technology places, shut it down, then you know, over a period of time, this, this country will go back because it will not be able to think new things. So India, um, you must realize that a very basic difference pointed out in this book between the Indian traditions and the Abrahamic traditions is that we keep Shruti and Smriti separate. So, Smriti is that which is being constantly updated. It's human constructed knowledge, it's constantly being changed. All R&D is Smriti. All R&D, new knowledge, new metallurgy, new mathematics, it's always being updated. There is no one discovery which is permanent and final and frozen. Shruti is eternal, but Smriti is always being updated. So these R&D centers are centers of producing Smritis to keep up and keep competing and learning more and more. The Smriti centers were shut down long ago, not just the British, but a very long time ago. So I think the analysis of why this has happened and why we started mimicking and how we were indoctrinated with some other ideas of knowledge and we accepted those and uh, those, that kind of uh, thinking is fairly standard. I don't think there's much more original research to be done with it because there are thousands of books written on uh, the colonization of the Indian mind. The question is what to do about it. See, the question is what do we do now? And so my program is first establish difference that don't get sucked into, don't get digested into what I call Western Universalism just because it's powerful. There are some areas of difference we should hang on to and understanding this difference is a resistance against getting digested. So once you have created a space and a critical mass of thinkers in this space who understand difference, then we can start exploring what are the merits of some of this difference. What are some of the, in what ways is, is this difference applicable positively today? There are some negative baggage also we have to get rid of. Difference is not all positive. Difference also means there are some problems we have to solve. So to upgrade ourselves, because it's like, you know, we have not, my R&D lab has not been able to do research for 200 years and somebody else has been keeping up. Now I got to uh, get my, revive my R&D lab and start thinking again. So I have to understand what's positive and move it forward, what is not so positive and I have to get rid of that. So this kind of a new program is needed.